Cyberpunk. I've had quite the emotional attachment to the word cyberpunk without really knowing what it is. Cyberpunk. It just sounds terrifically alluring. I've had a vague idea, a ghost image of futuristic neon pink and blue mega cityscapes. When deciding to work on some ruffians, randomly generated foes for the miniature tabletop skirmish game Stargrave, I thought, let's do some cyberpunk ruffians. And so neon colored blanks had to be filled. What is cyberpunk? The first immediate hunt for inspiration started, as it commonly does, at the Stockholm science fiction Antiquariat bookstore. This because, as with most things, all great stories come from books. But instead of boringly reciting the entire book-based history of cyberpunk, I'll instead try and describe the inspiration I've amassed while painting my ruffians and what cyberpunk now means to me. If you're used to other forms of sci-fi, imagine you're in that bar on Tatooine, but it's actually in Chicago. There's no aliens, no plasma guns, most probably there's knives. The only lights flickering bulbs of a neon sign behind the bar. There's no band, instead there's a self-playing karaoke machine, the microphone was stolen years back and the speakers annoyingly loud or even more annoyingly distortedly busted. The bartender accepts cash, only because this is a shady place. It goes straight into her pocket. A gang of black, fake, leather-clad youth eyes your stash of cash hungrily. Everyone is smoking cigarettes. Han Solo is actually a pimp slapping a drugged-out prostitute. You would never consider a visit to the bathroom a sure way to lose the rest of your money, but you don't really have to because the whole place already stinks. Cyberpunk is a dystopian near future where large corporations, sorry, megacorps, and organized crime, preferably the Yakuza, together with technology, preferably implanted technology, dictate the lives of humans. Drugs and direct sensory injected television is the sole food of the masses. Cities are massive, the slums even larger. The rich are richer, and the poor, well, let's just say I don't want to be poor in a cyberpunk setting. When choosing miniatures for this venture, there was, for me, an immediate way to go. The Escher Gang from Necromunda by Games Workshop. The aesthetics were already distinctly cyber and punk inspired. Gangs in both William Gibson books and, for example, the motorcycle clown gang in the movie Akira distinctly dress in codes. All very similar to each other. The fierce and confident Eshers were perfect in this regard. The distinct clothing, various cybernetic implants and, quote, traditional, unquote, weaponry. I did want a bit less glamour introduced, so more rough options. Chaos Cultists from Warhammer 40k was a great contender, a decisively rougher and maybe a little less cyber option. Me and my son visited our friendly neighbor Carl and his walk-in closet of Chaos miniature riches. Like kids in a candy store, cultists were snatched from their hoard to be remodeled into cyberpunk ruffians. I tried stripping the cultists with isopropanol, alcohol versus scale colors paint stripper. The conclusion is that they both strip paint. Isoprop for me was slightly more efficient, but on the other hand, the alcohol evaporates and thus becomes less uh, reusable. The scale color paint stripper is more reusable, but on the other hand, What's in that stuff, and how do I recycle it? The ultimate conclusion is that regardless of paint stripper, stripping paint is a messy job that ultimately can stain your floor, much like a cyberpunk crime scene. Now, I was mainly after the fabulous cultists' heads, very dystopian future-looking, and because these two sets of miniatures are similar in size, no heroic scale silliness, swapping heads worked out to be very Kit bashable. I also wanted some more obvious cyborg vibes, this being slightly off the cyberpunk script. Implants or even full cyborgs tend to be shaped and flesh covered to look like unaltered humans, but dealing with miniatures I feel obvious symbolism sometimes is more important than hidden facts. So I brought forth some old Necron bits, these being definitely larger scale but still workable to add some more cyber to the punk. I kept kit bashing. the Eshes being Games Workshop women are distinctly slim. Adding some muscle from the cultists was fun. I also wanted to stay away from the little pointy knives that come with the Eshes. More guns than brute force hand-to-hand -hand weapons give a distinctly more ruffian appearance. While working along I found this set of dead zone miniatures, more importantly an ape. 
Now, cyberpunk does not really do apes or aliens. It's most distinctly human-based. In the end, it doesn't get more twisted than human minds. But I mean, it's an ape. I just could not not have an ape in this gang. Giving it some Escher gang arms, a Necron backpack and some punk hair that unfortunately fell off and eventually got lost. So the ape got a haircut, I guess. But I mean, that's one rad ape. I also found a helmet from Anvil Industries, lovely plastic miniatures by the way, that gave me a nice motorcycle helmeted vibe. Finally, I put these Escher gang things on, what everything is, I'm not sure, power pack things, hand grenades, that kind of stuff, to tie the few cultists and ape together with the rest of the gang. And so, what does cyberpunk look like? How am I going to paint these? I think the most common visual aspect of cyberpunk is the lighting. One of my favorite lines describing this is from the book Mona Lisa Overdrive. Something moved behind the slot. Its color, the unhealthy pink of hot cigarette ash in noon sunlight. And Kumiko's face was washed with a stutter of light. Ridley Scott's movie Blade Runner, based on Philip K. Dick's book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, arguably one of the first cyberpunk books and consequently one of the first cyberpunk movies, is a glory in mood and lighting. The Matrix, apart from dodging bullets in slow motion, talks a very similar visual language. For me, the animated ghost in the shell is the ultimate mood setter, visually. But I mean, distinct lighting like this is not something I want to be doing for these more tabletop style miniatures. So instead I started to look at clothing, like what is everyone wearing? Turns out, looking past the mood and the lighting, pretty much anything. Normal. Removing all those neon signs and very intentionally lit uh, dystopian settings and in a way it's like removing the easy way out of how to paint cyberpunk. Clothes might be s slightly Asian inspired, preferably neutral colors. Black is a favorite, at least if you ask Keanu Reeves, but it's all quite everyday clothing, stuff that we would, at least could, wear today. The most striking examples, the one that kind of jumped out at me, was the use of bright primary colors in the movies uh, Akira and Ghost in the Shell, and William Gibson's writing, the mishmash explained in the books of very varied synthetic clothing, essentially very close to my son's perception of optimal fashion statements, confusion is better, harmony is for the weak. While looking at all of these visual sources of inspiration, one thing was poking my sense of color perception. A lot of all of this looks tinted. More specifically, tinted cool, purple, violet, blue. There's no neutral grey, that's where I would look for tints of colour. Akira, ghost in the shell, violet. The Matrix, sort of green in the world we think is real, and more sort of blue sci-fi in the real robot world. Uh, Johnny Min Minonic, uh, yeah, violet. Even browsing through Judge Dredd at the bookstore, there was a lot of violet. And so I stumbled into the world of something called mother color. Now, I'm no art scholar. My experiments are just that, experiments, but simplified. And perhaps stupefied by an amateur miniature painter. One can use a mother color to tint all the paints used while painting to achieve an effect. Or to just help color coherency along. For example, if you paint a sunset but add red to all your paints, your yellow will become slightly orange, your orange deeper and your blues a little purple. Very Miami Vice. By adding a mother color, it's also possible to make colors that in theory don't work well together to work, well, a little better together. Anyway, I wasn't really sure of how to go about things, but I decided to use Ghost in a Shell as a visual reference. Opening up some distinctly toned screenshots in Photoshop, I also opened up an image of a color wheel. Adding a layer of a solid color on top of the color wheel that I made slightly transparent, I could then sweep through different colors until I found an approximate match to the colors from Ghost in a Shell. It turned out to be a sort of medium bright violet. Bringing that color up on my phone, I tried to find a similar one among my paints and found one straight away. Pastel Violet from Scale Colors Artist Range. To be thorough, to see how this would work, I added some of the violet to base colors. Trying the difference between single pigment paints, regular, maybe not single pigment paints, using a transparent violet instead of the pastel violet, a darker violet to the darker paints, in the end deciding that I could make this all indefinitely more complicated than I already have. 
or I can just add the pastel violet to all the paints and be done with it. Why complicate complicated things even further? My miniatures were primed black, and as a bit of novelty, I decided to mainly layer paint these miniatures. For those of you that visit regularly, hi and thanks, you know, I wet blend quite a bit, but hey, we're doing things a bit more cyber and punk style this time, and besides, these minis are tiny and I need some layering practice. My approach was to use colours I would regularly use, but add violet to them, all of them, individually, even whites and blacks. The technique of painting this skin is quite representative of how I painted everything on these miniatures, starting out with a darker colour, trying to use the black underneath as means of shading. So having a pretty thin paint, letting the black shine through where I wanted things to be more shaded. Then, layer by layer, working up the highlights. Somewhere halfway up the highlight ladder, I would glaze in some colour tints, using paints utterly washed down to bring some colour into things, but also sort of smooth over previous mistakes. Then finishing off the final layer of highlights, nerve-wrackingly trying to not shake my hands while squinting furiously. Let's say I'm not really used to painting miniatures this small. Long live Stormcast heroic scale miniatures. Now I hear you asking, so uh, what did the violet do? Well, I quickly painted up this head of a mutilated chaos cultist, using exactly the same paints, but without adding any violet. The change in tone is hopefully relatively obvious. I then kept going. There are ten of these miniatures. Based on my William Gibson chaos clothing theory, the direct opposite of the William Gibson everyone in a gang looks identical clothing theory, I wanted an individual look for every miniature. Armor stolen from different megacorp security compounds, clothing bought secondhand in the sprawling slum or taken from a dead gang rival. A sense of fashion that would clash and slightly batter my uh, senses. By the way, all weaponry was decidedly painted black. Yes, there was a bit of violet in the black. And then just edge highlighted. My little homage to the black weaponed the Matrix. Certain colours definitely suffered by this violent violet treatment. Orange, most notably so. If you ever feel like you need a very unstriking orange, just add some violet to it. Consequently, this is why there will not be a single painted stroke of yellow on any of these miniatures. As an experiment, within the experiment, I really tried to see how well the mother colour would not only tint everything, but also bring things together, using more saturated paints versus less saturated paints in an array of different colours. The use of grey, white, khaki and military-style green felt important to represent the looting of former military materials, but then mixing that with, you know, I'm just going to the hairdresser and colour my hair shock purple, I'll be right back. You might remember me making a little video on trying to be efficient. This was the opposite. The amount of different colours and brands of paint used in this project is just silly. Also, the amount of violet added to individual colours varied a lot. A white, for example, turns violet just by looking at the neighbouring violet blob in the wet palette, and a chimera blue, on the other hand, could pretty much be diluted half and half with violet before anything major seemed to be happening. And so I painted, and I painted, and I painted, and next time, please let me know in advance to not make a video like this based on 10 miniatures, just the one or two would do, seriously. Moving my office was nothing compared to this. Anyway, once the miniatures were pretty much complete, I had a thought on the lighting thing. Removing the very striking lighting effects is a little like removing lightsabers and laser guns from Star Wars. Admittedly, if you're playing cyberpunk roleplay games, there's nothing to say that one day you might actually be outdoors during daytime in the slums, where no one can afford to pay their electricity bill to power up all the neon. And it would be potentially silly if your magenta OSL lit miniature was walking around constantly lit by a, in theory, non-existent light. But having a look at the Cyberpunk 2077 computer game, fortunately sometimes with Keanu Reeves, unfortunately without David Bowie. A lot of things apparently were not solved well in this game, but they did solve the light thing pretty smartly. Not only do cars have pretty rad lights going, a lot of clothing emits light as well. 
So that cyberpunk light vibe is carried around, so to speak. I wanted to do something similar and decided to go for the two, to me, most cyberpunk colors, magenta and cyanish blue, and do a little OSL glowing thing on the Escher Gang's paraphernalia, the little power pack things. When I paint glowy things, I usually start with the darkest shade of colored light, the furthest reach of the light source, something that isn't too much darker than whatever surface it would be hitting, but that essentially changes that surface into the color of the light source. And paint that wherever I want there to be a touch of colored light. Then I use brighter and brighter paint, working my way towards the center of the light source, trying to think what areas would be hit by the emitted light. On the actual source itself, I end up with pretty much a white. As a last step, I tone everything back down slightly with a glaze, a very thin down paint. In this case, the magenta I started with. This tones the white and the underlying paint slightly back into magenta property. I alternated the magenta with the blue on various miniatures, trying to get both colors in to complete the visual neon cyberpunk homage. Looking through a lot of different sources of inspirational material for this video, it's funny how little magenta and blue neon I've found in comparison to my own mental image. If you say cyberpunk, I say magenta and cyan. Well, mine was more turquoise, but you get my point. Lastly, I did some simplistic bases. There's so much going on with these miniatures that I've felt a need to calm things down and unite. Something a little more conceptual and blurry rather than the pinprick detail that goes on above, but still give a sense of monochrome, sci-fi, concrete dystopia. In the end, I'm pleased with the overall cyberpunk vibe. I think the weird color compositions on these kitbashed eshes and cultists feels right. It's not fully the cyberpunk image I had in my head before all the research, but a fun condensation of what I now think of as cyberpunk. The ape though, but although lovely, I so do not regret the ape, but just having an ape kind of makes things a little less cyberpunk. Maybe it was the unintentional haircut. And what about the mother color thing? Well, I think it did make it possible to bring this misuse of color combinations together, a sense of them all existing in the same environment. But I also don't think things would have looked absolutely eye bleeding without the mother color. I think this is a technique best used with a limited palette of single pigmentish paints. What does that mean? Well, most of the paints we buy for miniature painting are mixes of several pigments, several colors in the one bottle. Some of them already have violet in them. During this quite extensive process, there has been quite a few occasions where I would put a paint in the palette, add the violet to it and end up with the color of another paint I already have standing in the rack next to me. Whereas if one would be using a limited amount of single pigment colors, mixing one's own blends, using mother color would most probably be a nice tonal weapon. The biggest visual impact was being forced to add violet to colors I would never consider adding violet to. Like the orange. The orange on my minis, although dull, look very much like the orange in the movie Akira. And that was what I originally set out to do. There would be several other ways to experiment with mother color, like thinly airbrushing it on like a filter, but I'm just not going there with this tale. The thing for me to take home while making this video is finding inspiration from sources outside of the miniature world. Embracing them to then blindly follow whatever path that inspiration will lead. Even if it's an instant near-death experience in a megacity slum, I mean, I watched several movies, read three books, dabbled with new techniques, all to get ten miniatures on the table. And it was definitely worth it. My biggest source of inspiration for this paint job was the movie Ghost in the Shell, and books written by William Gibson. I mean, the man coined words like cyberspace and matrix, for Pete's sake. If your cyberpunk nerve has been tickled, I can warmly recommend the read. Links to all the inspiration will be down below. Thank you for watching. Bye.